options do we have to control our iron levels? Okay, we, we talked you can't get rid of it. Um, so can we control it through diet? Does eating less iron help? Um, or does the amount of iron in the food matter? Um, yes, the amount of iron in the, in the food does matter. So uh, I, I was talking before about blood donation. So blood donation is by far the most effective, efficient, fastest way to lower iron levels. So um, unfortunately, many people are not eligible to donate blood. Um, the second very similar option is therapeutic phlebotomy. So this is what for example, someone with, uh, they will do for someone with hemochromatosis. Therapeutic phlebotomy is basically just like blood donation, only the blood doesn't go to a donor, it is discarded. And also another difference with therapeutic phlebotomy is it can be done a lot more often. Somebody um, with severe hemochromatosis might have it done as much as two or three times a week. I've read of a case that where, where a man was getting a phlebotomy three times a week. Uh, and he was fine, but certainly once a week or once every few weeks, um, that's a lot more frequent than blood donation. And that, that can be done with therapeutic phlebotomy. Unfortunately, with therapeutic phlebotomy, this is another case where um, if somebody went to their doctor saying, you know, says, hey, doc, I, I, you know, can I have a therapeutic phlebotomy? Basically, the answer is going to be, well, you don't have a hemochromatosis. So, no, I'm not going to do it. Um, and so that that's a tough one to get around. Um, you asked about diet. Yes. Really in terms of diet, the best, uh, the best methods, the best, uh, the best means of, um, inhibiting iron absorption are to block iron absorption. So there are a number of supplements that block iron absorption, for example, curcumin, uh, green tea extract, um, uh, IP6, that's, uh, inositol hexaphosphate. Um, and you, you, you may have noticed in my paper that I published in aging, I discussed a lot of these. So many of these are, um, life have been shown to extend life in lab animals and they also block iron. So that is one way, uh, is the use of some of these supplements. Another way is various, uh, food combinations. For example, drinking coffee, tea, or red wine at, at meals will inhibit iron absorption quite a bit. Uh, there's actually been a, and, and then, uh, then also, um, dairy products inhibit iron absorption. So there's actually been a study looking at this where, uh, Dr. Fakini took, uh, diabetic patients and he had them on this diet, which was designed to block iron absorption and their ferritin levels did go down quite a bit. However, it does take longer. And in, in, in the case of this particular study, it was a couple of years. And presumably these people were pretty diligent at, um, at doing what they did. For example, you know, drinking coffee at meals and, and eating, you know, dairy products and et cetera, et cetera. So um, yes, it is possible. Um, certainly I would avoid any kind of fortified uh, any, any food fortified mm. with iron, um, and that, like I mentioned, flour and cornmeal in the U S is, uh, fortified with iron. And then on top of that, some of the like ready-made breakfast cereals, for example, they fortify it even more. Um, you can, you can get a huge dose of iron by eating certain of these, uh, you know, like cornflakes or other cereals. So those would definitely need to be avoided. It, it probably should be avoided anyway. But, yes, um, I agree with that. Yes, that's just there, one reason. Yes, that's just one reason. Yes, is there any um, is there any difference? So there seems to be a difference between uh, like vegetable iron and meat iron. I, can you just talk about that and, and which one is more easily absorbed? Right. So uh, the iron in meat is heme iron. So this is very similar to. Uh, the iron that's in our red blood cells, it comes in a, in a, a molecular package, so to speak, and, and it is absorbed um, fairly readily. Um, and then the kind of iron that's in plants, for example, grains, you know, flour and so on, or that's in fortified foods is free iron. So free iron is unligand iron 
it's it doesn't come in a molecular package it's just the bare bare naked iron so to speak um this is what the the free iron is what your body really wants to tightly control because free iron is um it's reactive it causes molecular damage um so um but you it, it can be absorbed very readily when when you consume it um, he, heme iron is thought to be more readily absorbed than uh, plant iron, but in fact, most people get most of their iron from plant foods, such as such as flour and things made from it, bread and so on. Right. So you you, you talk about chelation. I was checking, chelation, right, as a way of uh, grabbing. So is that that happens inside the body, but it, it doesn't actually remove the iron it just renders it um non-active um it it does remove the iron oh, right. um because because if if you um use a chelating agent um there are drugs that are iron chelators and then there are natural products that are iron chelators so if you if there's a chelating agent and it gets in into the circulation of your body it will it will bind to free iron. Um, so these, these are very sp specific chemical reactions um, and, and these molecules have coordinating sites that the iron, free iron just fits right into. And then these molecules themselves will be removed eventually. So for, for example, um, curcumin or, or uh, green tea uh, molecules they get inside your body, they will key, chelate iron, and eventually they get filtered out one way or another um, and, and removed. So yes, you do remove iron that way. You can do. Okay, cool. Thank you. So what other biomarkers? So we, we talked a lot about iron and, and ferritin. So what other biomarkers in terms of aging is it that you kind of think about? Right, right. So, um, you know, uh, so a lot of people are, you know, looking at lipid panels, um, and um, again, here this this is a place where, in my view, um, the mainstream has got a lot of things wrong. Um, they used to look at total cholesterol a lot, and more recently, they've decided that total cholesterol is less relevant. Now they want to look at LDL cholesterol. Well, in my view, that's not very relevant either. What I look at on a lipid panel is triglycerides and HDL cholesterol, and in particular, their ratio, the ratio of triglycerides to HDL. Um, there have been a number of interesting studies that have shown vastly increased risks of cardiovascular disease with people who have a high ratio of triglycerides to HDL. And this ratio as a marker um, absolutely dwarfs anything, um, anything to do with LDL cholesterol. So that's one thing that I look at. Um, the ratio of, of triglycerides to HDL should be below 2.0. I uh, caveat that is in American units, milligrams per deciliter. If you are somewhere where they're using millimoles as a unit, um, there is a different calculation that needs to be made. Um, so that is what I look like, look at other markers, um, for example, um, glucose. Yes, glucose is one of them. Um, you want to see definitely a normal glucose and particularly you would want it in the lower end of the normal range. That is a marker of aging for sure. Um, all these things, um, the, the one way to look at it is that in, in humans, aging um, remarkably resembles um, the progression to diabetes. So things that are associated with aging are uh, getting more body fat, having worse glucose control, getting visceral fat, um, losing muscle, all these things. So the, the, markers, the, the markers that are associated with metabolic health are, are good markers of aging. Fasting insulin level is another one. Um, you you want to have a low normal fasting insulin level for good metabolic health and for um, slowing down the aging process. Um, really, looking at all those markers, um, there there is a very simple 
non-lab way to um, decide if you're in good metabolic health, and that is your waist size. So the waist size should be one half of your height or less. And if it is um, greater than one half of your height, then you likely have some work to do. If you if it is less than one half, um, you very likely have good metabolic health. Right, which leads me to my next question. Which so uh, do you have a target like fat percent, body fat percent? Right. So um, for men, uh, about fifteen percent body fat is the upper limit for very good metabolic health. Now that's not to say that um, someone couldn't have good metabolic health if they had a somewhat higher percentage, but statistically speaking, above 15% body fat for men is where you start seeing that uh, people developing metabolic health problems. The corresponding for figure for women is a around 22%. Okay, so one thing, do you know, if you wanted to reduce visceral fat, in particular, is, is there some process that you would have to do that? Um, well, yes. Um, so the interesting thing about visceral fat is that it seems to be when, when people change their diets, and, <laughs> excuse me, and start losing weight, Visceral fat seems to be the first to go. So, for example, um, Dr. Roy Taylor in England, um, he's studied uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and he's gotten a lot of his patients into remission. And one of his original studies was um, basically he put people on a very low calorie diet. So people, people were eating uh, you know, consuming something like, uh, 700 calories a day, which is indeed low. And after one week, they found that, um, these people had normal blood sugars. So then he, Dr. Taylor has since found that, um, this type of remission of diabetes is very much dependent on getting rid of fat in the liver and in the pancreas. So, um, this seems to be the first to go when, when people start losing weight. So that's a bit of good news. Um, there was a recent study where people went on a ketogenic diet, um, and in six days only on the ketogenic diet, they lost something like, um, 30% or maybe more 30% or more of their liver fat. So this is actually relatively easy to get rid of. It seems stop eating sugar, stop eating refined carbs, um, and eat, you know, eat healthy, real whole foods, do some exercise and the, uh, visceral fat, uh, seems to go away rather quickly. 